still want it. Can you lose? No, it's in my bag. Oh, it's in your bag. who 
Now, some of you may know it's run uh, a couple of times. Here, 30 years ago. Yay! And also, Bob and Yasmin Bar is also a veteran candidate for a number of times. It was not, believe it or not, you know, we live in this culture of political parties all the time. And incredibly, it was not until the 1970s that political parties became part of the Canada Elections Act. There were a couple of amendments to the Elections Act. But basically, the first simply recognized political parties, and the second one uh, made it so that for the very first time in Canada, the name uh, of the party actually appeared beside the name of the candidate. Now, that's an important thing, because it does seem to me that at that point, uh, politics became perhaps more party conscious than it has been in the past. You will notice that all the candidates tonight have uh, a sign indicating their names. Uh, the other side has their party affiliation along with their name, and it is their choice tonight uh, how they uh, wish to represent themselves to you. There are two kinds of parties. Some are registered and some are not registered. And an unregistered party absolutely is a political party. It's just that they appear as an independent on the ballot. And tonight we have Leslie Gorey, who although will appear as an independent candidate, is in fact the leader of the uh, newly formed Maple Party of Canada. And then we have, as you might expect, a number of candidates, the majority, which is normally the case in politics, who are here representing uh, registered political parties. And I think just sort of going down the list here, I'm sure you know these people at this point, but just in any case, very quickly, and then they'll say a little bit more about themselves. Grant Gordon. Dorian Baxter, representing the CCs. Could I get Progressive Canadian? Well, thank you. I was going to say, can you clarify where Progressive Canadian is? Absolutely. The Progressive Canadian, with emphasis on the PC. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Adrienne McNaught of the Moon. <laughs> also a veteran candidate. A veteran candidate you may recognize in this very seat in the last federal election when we ran a similar evening here before, the Green Party of Canada. Christopher Porter, a okay, special effort. You come in from the West Coast for this, right? Yeah, you come in from the West Coast specifically for this. And I mean, if that isn't a commitment to the markets, I don't know what else is. But the Canadian Action Party. Continuing along, the New Democratic Party, well-known from writing and a well-known candidate with Craig Scott. A warm welcome to John Recker, the Libertarian Party of Canada, who <laughs> it is important to have you balance, you know, the issues of government in general. <laughs> and we have one candidate not here, Andrew Keyes, who represents the Conservative Party of Canada. And to articulate the obvious, to articulate the obvious, he was invited on numerous occasions. So this is in no uh, uh, case an instance of exclusion. Uh, I want to join you very quickly to welcome all the candidates one more time. I'm so sorry. Actually, I'm sorry, no, I did introduce Bob at the beginning. Yeah, Brian. 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 Well, Brian is not here. That's why I didn't introduce him. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, he also clearly was uh, was invited. And um, I have a feeling he might actually be watching at some point. Uh, I just saw anyway, him last night. I'm sorry? I just saw him last night. And did you say he was going to be here? I, I thought he was expecting to be I had every reason to believe that he was going to be here. Um, and I think he might uh, actually show up. Okay, but in any case, uh, we, need, we need to get going here. Okay, now let me tell you uh, what we're going to be doing. This is essentially the fourth live debate, I believe. 
Yes? One, one, two, three, four. Okay. Yep. Don't forget the one at the school, Brandon. Good, good. I didn't get an invite to that one. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, John, you are here tonight, and everybody <laughs> appreciate that. The kids got a bad example. <laughs> well, more on that later, perhaps. Maybe. Okay, or maybe not, depending. Okay. Uh, so, what, what we're going to be doing is, we're going to start off with some general questions, but the questions all clearly are in the context of these people having been here before. I know a number of you have seen them before, so I think it's an opportunity for a little bit of brush up. Now, every candidate will have a chance to answer every question. We do have a number of candidates. That's the good news, as I indicated. It's also the bad news when it comes to trying to run this thing effectively. Therefore, each candidate will have 90 seconds to answer every question. And how do we enforce that? Well, we have an enforcer. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce to you Kyle Ten, who is a grade 12 student at Danforth Tech. how they feel by the end of the evening. Uh, he does not live in the riding and therefore cannot vote and therefore is completely neutral in his enforcement of the time. After having gone through some general questions, which I hope the candidates will see as an opportunity for clean up on some of the things they've said in the past, we're going to do something a little bit different and that is wouldn't it be nice to have the candidates the opportunity, give them the opportunity to ask another candidate a question and engage in a bit of dialogue? Would that be of interest to you? Yeah. I thought so. With a So that is something that we are going to do. Okay. Anyway, it's pretty clear. Uh, you know, looking at the debates, hearing from people, etc., that there are some very, very broad, broad issues that. You know, people always hear, always express perhaps at the door, perhaps in their frustration. Focusing on frustration, though, for a second here. You know, democracy is a great thing, but it is not a spectator sport. And the voter turnout is very, very low in Canada. I think perhaps people are somewhat electioned out. And it's gotten to the point where, because of the first past the post system, it is possible for an MP to be elected by receiving the votes of as little as 20% of the voters in a riding. You can imagine that, 20%. So the first question that I would like to address the candidates on is, I mean, given that, and given that it doesn't change the balance of power at all in Parliament, why does this election even matter to the voters of Toronto Danforth? And how, especially if you were elected, would this make a difference in their lives? We'll begin with Leslie, and of course we'll change the order as we go through the evening. But Leslie? Thanks, John. Oh, we always speak for Well, you know, I, I believe that people should have a choice of standing or sitting. And uh, up to you. Oh, well, actually, you know what? I'm going to let you decide that. You want them standing or sitting? The implications of electing me would be you show other Canadians that you're not afraid for some, to do something different. You're not afraid to stick your necks up a little bit. And it's about time someone did that. We keep following the same party lines, and we keep getting the same lifestyle. No matter who we vote for, we always get the same thing. So if you vote for someone different, if you vote for the Maple Party, We'll clearly lay out our platform for you. You'll know what you're voting for, and we have every intention of carrying through with our plans. So the best thing I think you could do is vote for the Maple Party. We're going to make everybody's life a lot better. It'll be a better nation, a stronger nation. It'll be a nation worth fighting for. We'll be more united. When people have what they need to live, they're more relaxed. They get along with their neighbors a lot better. It makes for a better lifestyle. It makes for industrious people. Thank you. Actually, 
have one more announcement that I neglected to make. It has to do with the media this evening. Um, you can see that CBC is here, and CTV over there. We have a number. And uh, what I was asked was to make sure that this particular CBC might at least get passed down as you are speaking. Have I got that right? Where's the person? Have I got that right? Yes. It was where everything's working fine. Okay, that's fine. Could you clarify how much time we have for the opening, John? Um, well, actually, I, I did. I, I kind of skipped the opening. So I'll tell you what. I'll tell, I'll tell you what. Okay, it wasn't very long. Okay, it was only 30 seconds. But what you can do, if you like, is just tag 30 seconds. But here's what I want the opening to be. Okay, who are you as a person? Okay. As a person, I am. My name is Grant Gordon. Thank you for having me tonight. I'm a Liberal candidate in the upcoming by-election. For the past 10 years, I've been running a company that I founded called Key Gordon Communications. And at my company, we fight for change. We fight for social change and environmental change. We fight for cleaner air, cleaner water, cleaner food, better nutrition for children, better education, all the good stuff. We fight to make the world a better place. Now, I believe I'm ready, instead of advocating for change from the outside of the government, I'm ready to go inside government and fight for change and be effective. I hope after this evening, you'll agree. Thank you very much. I, uh, I would like to say that uh, I really am honored tonight. My name is Dorian Baxter, and I am the candidate for the real PC party. We are the Progressive Canadian Party. But I just want to tell you, before I go any further, I am so honored that the leader of our party, the Honorable Sinclair Stevens and his lovely wife, Noreen, have walked in and I'd like them to stand. Would you give them a round of applause? Sinclair Stevens and his lovely wife. Uh, I know this is supposed to be about me, John, but I want to say I was thrilled to see the Honorable Sinclair Stevens single handedly suing the Harper regime. He was successful. They were found to have willfully violated the provisions of the Canada Elections Act, and that's why I'm here tonight to hold them accountable. I want you to make this election a referendum on the Harper regime. Half my salary is going back to you. Thank you so much, Dorian Baxter. Thank you very much. 30 seconds, everyone. My name is Adriana Lugnano Hamu. I am a resident here and I want to make Toronto Danforth as beautiful, as safe, and as healthy as it can be. And I've been working on this in a lot of community groups for many years. What brought me into politics was a concern about our children and the fact that their needs are not being addressed in Parliament. As I've walked door to door over the last five weeks, I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of people who think that the parties in Parliament are doing enough. None of them, none of them are advocating for the changes that our children need. And they all know that. People say they want more of the Green Party. They love Elizabeth May. They'd love for me to join her. And they're worried. They're worried. They're made to worry, they're made to fear, they're made to vote for other parties because they're afraid that the consequences might be too great. The consequences in this election are low. As John said, nothing's going to change. One thing that you can do is send a voice to Parliament for our children. Thank you. My name is Christopher Porter, and the leader of the Canadian Action Party. And I want to show of hands, how many of you think that we need a better government? <laughs> Candidates as well. <laughs> that is why I am running. I grew up in the, uh, all, was fortunate to travel the world, and was shocked to see a small South Pacific nation get taken over its resources. Came back to Canada even more shocked to see how many resources that we're sending out of this country without employing our own citizens. 
This is about democracy. You ask why it's important to vote? It's important to vote to participate. If you are not participating, you're speculating or spectating. And unfortunately, we have too many people speculating our great nation. Thank you for your spectation here tonight. But more importantly, I thank you for your participation and uh, get everyone out there to vote. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Craig Scott, I'm running for the NDP party here in the Riding. Throughout my career as a law professor and an activist, uh, throughout Toronto, Canada and around the world, I've stood up for people, I've stood up against abuses of power and that's what I want to continue to do by going to Ottawa and standing up against Stephen Harper with an incredibly strong opposition who's made up the official opposition since last spring. I've also been living in this riding for uh, almost 22 years. It's my home. It means an awful lot to me to be a really strong local MP who brings Toronto Danforth to Ottawa, who gets things done here with other levels of government in, in terms of representation, Peter Tappins and the councillors, in the tradition that has become the NDP tradition in this riding. Most of all, I want to be known as a worthy successor to the former MP and somebody for whom uh, this riding will be proud. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is John Christopher Record, and I'm uh, your Libertarian candidate. Um, like many people, um, I see what a mess our, our government has made of our country, and I want to do something to fix that. We deserve better than a big party government um, who's mainly concerned about getting and holding on to power. We can make our community better for everyone in it by increasing individual freedom, individual, individual responsibility, and by focusing on real, evidence-based uh, solutions to the issues that uh, are facing our community and our country. Thank you very much. Why it's important to vote for me? Well, this is the plume of radiation coming from Fukushima last year, in April, and we all got hit with us, right down in nuclear fallout. And on March 25th, Health Canada turned off all their fallout detectors, so all the pregnant women in BC weren't warned to stay indoors, and baby deaths tripled. Aww, oh, Stephen Harper's heroes, to not cause a panic. But if you see my videos, I was screaming, take cover! All right, well now we're all gonna get a really big bunch of cancers, and you'll also find that I wanted to mass produce marijuana to fight those cancers, because marijuana cuts lung cancer tumor growth in half, the truth is coming out that marijuana kills cancer and marijuana is good for Alzheimer because it boosts brain cell growth. Yeah. Which explains why I'm so sharp and they're so dull. Yeah. So anyway, that's the thing. Now I see Justin Trudeau in the audience and I picketed Parliament Hill for five years in the early 80s with my bankers are crooks and abolish interest rates sign. Oh, yeah. oh, the biggest disappointment of the whole party was you guys never okay, came from no, your no, promise no, to legalize no, marijuana. No, thank you. So do it! I can't talk it. <laughs> My name is Batman. I am running as an independent candidate. Who I am, who am I, whatever you put the question. I am a frustrated citizen here. I am tired and sick of the, these main parties bickering at each other, even including last night debate in the Payton's show. They are not elected yet, and yet they start to bickering and accusing each other. Can you imagine when they get to the parliament what they do? Exactly. Business as usual. Why I am running? I know there is no chance in hell I get elected. <laughs> Because my job, from my perspective, is when I go in front of the mirror every day, I say I did what I could. Tonight, I ask you what you can do. And do it. Responsibly, go. Thank you. Thank 
case. Um, so we've had Justin Trudeau It's not the first time this government tried to intrude to your personal life. There was a bill that called BC C6 that passed a few months back or late last year. And given uh, that bill gave uh, extraordinary power in the hand of the uh, people in the Ministry of Health to come to your home and confiscate whatever they want under the name of the protection of the consumer. What I see is very simple. We, they come and beg you for vote. They go there. They pass a bill. They collect your tax. Then they say, OK, we have done with them. No, we haven't. Let's go after them and bother them more. BLC 30 that is being run right now about the intrusion, they want to go to your hard drive to see who do you talk to, with whom do you talk to? It is invasion of the privacy. It is against the Constitution of the Canada. Thank you. Thank you. Geez, I think if we're hearing about it, they're already doing it. And compared to a job, privacy is one of the least rights I'm worried about. Okay? I mean, in Argentina, the union said, you're not going to lay us off because you got no money. You're going to print up some provincial bonds, small denomination, we can use for hydro, medical, taxes, licenses. We'll take that for our money. You're not going to lay us off. No layoffs. Five years later, all foreign debt paid off. Well, everybody heard about Argentina going broke in 2001, but they didn't hear about them paying off all the debt in 2006, and Russia did it when they crashed in the 90s too. 750 local governments issued their own currencies and 25,000 different corporations. Shell rubles, Ford rubles, GM rubles. When they had no other government rubles, they issued their own corporate dollars. Everybody took them and they survived because that's good chips. But privacy is not too important. I think we need less laws and not more prisons. Um, like, this is just another, this bill's just another symptom of a government that believes it can do whatever it wants, regardless of how the majority of people in Canada feel about uh, what they're doing. Um, I would certainly oppose this law and any other like it that uh, just restricts our freedoms even further and um, only benefits people who um, make a lot of money and uh, a government that is just trying to restrict us even further. Thank you. Well, B Bill C-30, the position of the NDP, and obviously my own position uh, independently of that, is that this bill should not even go forward. It should be stopped dead in its tracks. There's no tweaking. <laughs> The third party opposition is accepting that this can be tweaked, it can't be. 
You've got warrantless access to sub subscriber information. You've got inspectors who can come in without warrants and remove any content from telecommunications providers. And you've got a catch-all discretion that allows the government to enact regulations that will deepen the intrusiveness of this bill. Plus, you've got the requirement that all telecommunication providers have to put in surveillance systems that can be put into uh, operation in and through other, the operation of other areas of the law. All of this is setting us up for a surveillance society that is something that Canadians do not want and cannot afford uh, to allow to happen. So the, the, the bottom line is this cannot go forward. It cannot be tweaked. And it's also the, the last thing I would say on that is that it's quite important to know that the Liberal Party is arguing that it should be tweaked and can be tweaked because elements of this are the same as a bill called Bill C-74 that the Liberals introduced in the mid-2000s. And they have to explain exactly what the differences in their approach is and, and the approach of the government on this issue. Internet freedom. We're talking about going to war with Syria for spying. We're, we've gone to war in Afghanistan, Iraq, and how many other countries for such laws like this. So of course we need internet freedom, but more importantly we need you to voice your opinion on internet freedom. And once again I would ask a show of hands, how many believe that Canada needs internet freedom? Only half. <laughs> <laughs> there are adequate laws in place now so that people who do the kinds of things that this government claims to be worried about can be caught. We do not need warrantless wiretapping. We do not need warrantless surveillance. What this bill purports to do, it fails to do. So it has no business, um, no business being brought forward. I do want to say, though, that I would really like to use the current laws to investigate very deeply this government's uh, responsibility in the robo uh, robocalls and other scandals. And, and I think the laws are adequate for that, too. I just wanted to clarify, Mr. Moderator, um, I heard 60 seconds and 90 from you. Is it 60 or 90? It is 90, but they've been going with 60, so what he said is going to be 60 for this. Okay. We're, we're burning what we should. And we're starting now? Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I, uh, Sorry, your time's up. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I just want to say, first of all, I categorically will represent the Toronto Danforth riding in making sure your voice is heard to extinguish this bill before it gets off the ground. So I'm not in favour of that. What I am in favour of, I'm in favour of this government putting an end to this ridiculous idea of spending billions of dollars on fighter jets. I have another plan. I have a plan here. We have eight railway tracks coming into this area. The Honourable Sinclair Stevens did the research. For half the price of those jets, we can double track and we can make darn sure there is no congestion and no more pollution. Let's focus on what this government needs to do. And I have to stand beside this lovely young lady and say, let's have a royal inquiry into those robocalls. Thank you very much. So we've got this proposed Orwellian surveillance system. Mr. Harper wants to buy fighter jets. There's going to be a massive prison build out. It's enough to make a conspiracy theorist paranoid. What's Mr. Harper up to? Uh, in this case, Bill C-30, of course, it has to be thrown out. It's had its first reading. It, we have to start from scratch again. There has to be balance. I honestly believe that the police, the government, at times, has a right to search our houses, 
if, if there is a judge that thinks they should and a hard drive is no different. There has to be a judicial overview. Thank you. We fought a Cold War against the Soviet Union with nuclear weapons pointed to their heads. Uh, we didn't resort to these overt tactics. We kept them secret. And know back in the day that if you spoke on the telephone, certain key words would trigger recording devices all over the country. And your conversations would be recorded. We've had measures like this for quite a long time. But I found if you don't go around the world making enemies, you don't have to look over your shoulder as often either. And if we show the people of the world that we've been offending and killing in the last little while, that we're serious about justice, and about keeping our hands to ourselves, and instead making this world a better place, we'll have a lot less enemies in this world to worry about. We want to spot our own people to find out just to see what's going on out there. Thanks. So the Maple Party is going to implement a plan of virtual neutrality for Canada. We're not going to send our troops anywhere else anymore. There has to be a direct attack on our own self to let that happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Interesting, not a single one of you was in support of Bill C-30. Not a surprise either. But I want to ask you this question. Should you be elected on March 19th, you're going to Parliament as the representative of Toronto Danville. What if you are in a situation for, if for whatever reason, your party was in support of Bill C-30? Where would you see your moral obligation? <clears throat> to vote your conscience? To vote in terms of what you believe the residents of Toronto Danforth would want? Or along with your party? This time we'll start with Craig moving down towards Bob, and then we'll pick up with Chris. Well, I trust everybody will uh, forgive me if I say that the question was hypothetical, and I'll treat it partly as a hypothetical, which is that's not going to happen in my case with the NDP. The NDP will not be voting for this bill. On the broader issue that I think the question is trying to get at, John, uh, about the right of MPs to vote their conscience, uh, it's important to know that um, Jack Layton, as leader, wanted to open that up even further within the NDP. Whether or not he succeeded or not is something uh, that uh, we can debate. But we do need more room for uh, free votes on you know, issues in the House of Commons in a way that uh, we've lost a bit in part of the tradition, the way you described uh, the evolution of the parliamentary system. That said, you need cohesion and you need internal discussion, fierce debate within a party, and once you come to a position, just the same as cabinet does, you need a, a, a strong measure of solidarity. If I ever felt that I could not vote uh, against my conscience and uh, voted against my own party, I would be prepared to take the lumps. That's what happens within the system. Same as civil disobedience. The best of, the, uh, best of those who engage in civil disobedience know that they're going to be attracting the force of the law because of their civil, dis civil disobedience. So I hope not to be faced with that situation if uh, I'm in Parliament. But there might well be uh, situations where I vote my conscience, in which case I have to take my lumps. Well, certainly the Libertarian Party wouldn't uh, wouldn't be voting in favor of this bill, in favor of more regulation. That's just not going to happen. Um, but personally, if if a situation did arise where um, the leader of the party uh, and other members of the party held a position contrary to uh, my conscience or uh, the wishes of uh, the right, then I would have to weigh um, their opinion and uh, those of the writing and go with what my conscience uh, believes. Thank you. Well, 
if you Google or YouTube for Great Canadian Gambler, I come up. I'm a professional poker player at the Brantford Casino. I was known as the professor at the Taj Mahal in Atlantic City. I was a teaching assistant of Canada's only mathematics and gambling course at Carleton University. Has busted so often they joke by cell at the Ottawa police station had a revolving door. But they eventually legalized gambling so they wouldn't have to bust me no more. But who would I obey? Would I listen to me? What I think is right? What the people think is right? And what party thinks is right? Well, since I'm sharper than they are, and I can figure out winning strategy using math, I think I'd go with my estimations and my gambles, and that's why I am a professional winner. I found ways of doing stuff that are pretty neat. Printing up bonds. I got arrested thinking in the IMF World Bank in 82, passing out the bond idea before Argentina used it. And then I brought it to the broad Greenwood by-election. Worst result I ever got, 16 votes. So it's not called the Broad New Greenwood solution, it's called the Argentine solution now of taking bonds in your paycheck instead of being broke. So I have an interview with a lady running a clinic in the Brantford. I said, would you take bonds instead of nothing for your raise? And she went, of course. Well, of course you would if you got any brains. Who wants to sit on a picket line when you can create your own currency and tell them what to pay you with? But most people don't know about money reform, so you'll have to visit my site. <laughs> Thank you, John. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't have that problem with the independent candidate. <laughs> Especially me. <laughs> I don't take order from party leaders. I don't take order from union bosses. I don't take order from a special group. And at my age, I have a very difficult man to be bought. <laughs> Especially with my attitude. <laughs> so, answer your question is very clear. The moment one of these three colors, or four, one of them is missing, goes to Ottawa, all of the promises you heard is gone with the wind. What you get, what you see, is me. What you get, what you see. I only take order from my constituents if they choose me. If they don't, even I don't have to take that order. <laughs> Well, I'm fortunate being a leader of a party, but that's not because I want to be boss. It's because I really want the people to be the boss. And to be honest, you all shocked me when half of you voted against internet freedom. It's about direct democracy. We need to be involved. And that's why the Canadian Action Party stands dedicated to direct democracy. And that involves participation by all voters. No party here represents all of you when they get up to Parliament. That is our current system. And that system must change. We must get to a system where your voice is carried, and that demands that you're involved. It demands more town halls. We need more of these meetings after elections, not just during elections. So, of course, I would vote on behalf of what you're saying. So can you show me that one more time? Because I've worked with cannibals, headhunters. I've done a lot in my life. Killer whales that have killed, and I cannot believe in Canada half of you voted for no internet freedom. So can we have that vote again? How many of you vote for internet freedom? That means no spying. Okay, we just had a lack of participation there of the first time. That's the problem with our system. We don't have enough participation. Come and check us out. That's all we're about. my conscience 100% of the time. I want to make that very clear. I would vote my conscience 100% of the time. What, my, what contributes to my conscience has a great deal to do with the direction that the country needs to take. A lot of concerns that may be brought in my caucus, but a lot of it will come from concerns from you, and I do want to be a very community-oriented parliamentarian. When other parties say that they will vote their conscience, that they will vote their ethics, I don't believe it. And I'll give you an example. Immediately after the last government was elected, there, uh, Stephen Harper called for unanimous consent 
for the continued bombing of Libya. This was at a time when the overwhelming majority of Canadians were against this measure. And yet, every single parliamentarian voted with Stephen Harper, the entire NDP caucus, the entire Liberal caucus, and the entire Bloc caucus voted with him. The only one who stood up was Elizabeth May. And she said, no, this is wrong. Afterwards, a number of NDP peace activists thanked her for her vote because she delayed the, that bill. And they said they wanted to vote against it, but they were prohibited. Every other party literally gets a sheet every day that tells them how to vote. And if they don't vote that way, they risk getting expelled, if, if thrown out of their party. It is, I do not believe that any other party will vote with their, with their conscience. The Green Party does want to return to the older Westminster tradition. That's what we're all about. Thank you. First of all, I would like to congratulate John on the marvelous sound system. Would you give him a round of applause? Actually, what I forgot to do in the intro, I want to make sure I do this. Is I'd like you to all join me in thanking Reverend Edith N. Chance of the Don Mills United Church for making this available. Uh, I understand she's a Baxter as well, is that right? Is her last name Baxter? Uh, that I don't know, but I think there are ways you can now. Well, I'm just pushing, pushing the name tonight, so that's it. So, I believe my time is about to start now. Thank you very much. <laughs> I want you to know that I really will represent you. I will represent your conscience. And let me tell you right now that we already, thanks to our leader, the Honorable St. Clair Stevens, we already are committed totally to the Westminster model of parliamentary democracy. And that model has been violated since the year 2003. Stephen Harper has an entire array of what we call shills. Do you know what they do when they get up to represent you and their area? They identify themselves and then they say, we're so pleased, uh, Mr. Flair, to tell you all about the wonderful things he's doing. And they sacrifice your time and their constituents' time to propagandize what this Harper regime is doing. I want you to know that without evasion, equivocation, or mental reservation of any kind, I will stand up for you, for your rights. I happen to be the only candidate that is giving half my salary back to you because I want to fund programs. And I'm asking all of Ottawa to follow my example. If they did that, we might have less people trying to steal our pensions. Thank you very much. So in so many of these debates, you know, there have been questions about where are you on Bill C-30, where are you on Bill C-11, and what do you know about Bill C-92.4695 B. Uh, <laughs> So much of this job is about the values you take to Ottawa. And so much of it is about your position on all kinds of bills we don't see coming and we have no idea about. So the idea of this democracy is to learn the values of your candidates and then choose the person who you believe will be true to their values in Ottawa in the future with future problems. Now, I have a question for the panel. Who on the panel has written and designed all their own materials for this campaign? <laughs> <laughs> I love it, I love it. Now, I see that the Greens and the NDP guys did not write their own campaign materials. Nor did you, Grant. Uh, excuse me, I did. There's stuff in there you did not. Excuse me, well, my main campaign materials, all my brochures, I want to hear No fighting tonight. Okay. So listen, I'm just waiting. No, let's get it. I just made fight. I have written my own brochures. That should say enough. I am my own man, and obviously in Ottawa, I'll be my own man there as well. Thank you.
Mike will certainly vote against Bill C-30. And as leader of the Maple Party, if a situation arises that we didn't discuss during the election, uh, if we make a promise to our people, uh, it's the policy of the Maple Party where it's forbidden not to keep your word. Every candidate has to vote for things that we brought up during the election. Now, if something comes up out of the blue, I would like to think that the people of my party would vote against such a bill. But if they don't, I can't really put the hammer down as leader because we didn't discuss it ahead of time. So they'll be free to do what they'd like to do, and if we don't like the decisions, we can always look for other candidates for the next election. <laughs> That's how it works. You don't have to be hard-handed. Just let people do their own thinking. But when it comes to informing the public at election time, this time, like tonight, whatever we say, we have to do if we're elected. No one in the Maple Party will ever be forgiven for lying to the public about policies. You know, if it's personal things, it's not the public's business. And if they're too embarrassed to admit the truth, then maybe they'll lie about things like that. But as far as things that affect your lives, money issues, crime, things like that, justice, they're forbidden to lie. No one's allowed to. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, no interrupting each other. All right. Um, you know, I've been watching the television debates where not everybody attended. Uh, hey, not everybody invited. I would have gone. Yeah! <laughs> now that you mentioned that, now that you mentioned that, uh, I have been asked to, and I thought about what to do this, I decided to do this, to read a joint statement from the independent and small party candidates of Toronto Danforth on exactly that point. Uh, I'm led to believe that all of them have signed off on this. Uh, I've decided to read it myself rather than uh, give somebody else an extra 30 seconds or whatever. But here's what it says. This John, John, could you put your sweet lips a little closer to the phone? Here's the say. You see, this is important. We, the independent and small party candidates, we, the independent and small party candidates in Toronto Danforth by-election, wish to issue a joint statement at this time as the mainstream corporate media tends to marginalize the true voice of the people in favor of the established mainstream political parties. We feel that certain issues are not being addressed by these mainstream parties because they run contrary to the agenda of the corporate and banking systems that have been controlling the political agenda for some time. We as a group feel that Canada is in dire need for reforms to its system of governance, first of which is monetary reform and a return to utilizing the Bank of Canada to regain control of the issues of currency. Yeah, yes, sir. Second, that a national initiative be undertaken to reform both the parliamentary and electoral systems to ensure a more accurate and fair system of governance. And lastly, and lastly, an end to the policies of globalization and integration to ensure Canadian sovereignty and self-determination. Without these issues being addressed, we believe democracy in Canada may become ineffective and in danger of disappearing completely. <laughs> Message delivered. <laughs> Going back to the, uh, the television debate, which is largely prompting my next question, and having attended the live debates, uh, the first question that I think almost every single moderator asked was, so what's happening when you go to the door? You know, what are people telling you? This kind of stuff. And um, what I, and, and, and your answers were not necessarily each of you this language, but people are hurting, people are worried, people are concerned. And um, examples, uh, let's see, repeated over and over, families are having trouble making ends meet. Debt levels are high. Costs are rising. Taxes are increasing. Any of this sound familiar to anybody here tonight? Yeah. Okay. Going back to another, another, another older politician, John Kennedy once said, a country that cannot care for its weakest citizens will never be able to protect its most powerful. 
Now on that note, I'm wondering if you could address, in a general sense, what you think the role of government is to assist people, either directly or assist people in helping themselves, either in a general sense or in reference to specific programs. And this time, I'd like to start with Grant, and we will skip to Adriana, then we're going to be going twos till everybody's done. Grant. The role of government. <coughs> Families are hurting. The times are tough in Toronto Danforth. How would you, as MP for Toronto Danforth, utilize your capacity as MP and the legislative power of government to help? You? Great. Well, let's break it down. Child care. I believe that there should be a, a quality, high quality child care spot for every child in this country. I believe that we, the CPP and old age security are fundamental to upholding fairness and equality across this country and we have to do everything we can to protect both. Well, I feel a little bit like this is a social studies question from grade six, um, but the role of government, people are hurting in our society. Well, youth unemployment is a big problem right now, and we know that Stephen Harper has made massive cuts. There's no more uh, mentoring program for kids. We need to resurrect that. Maybe we have to do that ourselves in our own riding with a mentoring program. We know that children are going to school hungry in our riding. I believe it's a fundamental role of our government to make sure our children are starting school with a healthy breakfast inside them. It will save us heaps of money down the road. If we are going to welcome people to our country from overseas, we have to do everything we can to set them up, teach them English as their second language, and it will, of course, save us tons of money down the road and it will help make them fulfilled citizens. Thank you. Begin by thanking you, John, for the, the quote from John Kennedy, because that's very much in line with what I believe. Government's most important uh, function is to worry about the people who are uh, who are having trouble, because people who have uh, high incomes, people who have means and abilities, can generally take care of themselves. They don't need so much government interference. Um, my priority in getting to Parliament, what I see as missing in Parliament, what desperately is needed, is a voice for future generations. Our parliamentary system works in four-year electoral cycles, so there's a built-in incentive for, for all parties not to worry about what comes in after four years. And that's something the Green Party excels at, and it's the reason why I joined this party. Because when you think about things like climate change, the impacts of what we do now have profound this. The consequences of what we do now have profound impacts 10, 20, 30 years from now, so we don't worry about it. The Green Party does. We are the only party that advocates the kind of really bold measures that we need to do now so that our kids can have the future opportunities that we enjoy. The second thing that I would do, that I would focus on in Parliament, is to push for uh, a guaranteed annual income for everyone. What we're doing now is keeping people in poverty at great public expense. We can do it cheaper, more effectively, and everybody can benefit if we do that. The third thing is to reform democracy, and I'm out of time so I can't say it, but those are the things I focus on.
question is, uh, uh, I understood John having first formulated the role of government in, uh, with respect to the fundamental issue of helping people in need uh, is at the core of the question. And, and frankly, I think everybody in the room knows that's the very ethos, the lifeblood, the history of the NDP uh, for the last 50 years and going back to when uh, it grew out of the CCF. Uh, my own career has been focused on uh, promoting in both my research and in activism, economic, social and cultural rights as fundamental human rights. I worked in the South African Constitution on exactly that issue with the African National Congress. And uh, it's, it's just uh, a bottom line premise of the NDP that people in need, the most vulnerable and disadvantaged members of society, come first in any philosophy uh, of justice. It's a fundamental premise that the enablement of the conditions for a dignified life are something that we all owe each other. Uh, there's not much more to be said. It's a very, very uh, deeply ingrained philosophy of social democracy. And uh, I think people trust the NDP to forward exactly that philosophy in a careful, uh, pragmatic, but passionate way. Thank you. run a fair game and that's enough and no I don't go door to door okay I mean uh, knocking on a few thousand doors maybe they can do that and come to a meeting and talking to a couple of hundred people half of them party clappers and then on TV with the tens of thousands I don't get on CPAC parliamentary channel same four you know and Rogers same four or three because the Tory ain't showing up he's so bad last night TVO Steve Pankin show, same three. Guaranteed nothing new. Anyway, I posted a video. I went and took the video of these guys last night, and I threw in my comments with no restriction on time. And I caught up, okay? And they're going to get what they deserve. Instead of me being able to answer just with one minute, and now I can put off books to them all I want. So it's called Steve Pankin's Not All Candidates Debate. Go to YouTube tonight. You've got to watch the whole book. Show not one new idea, though you're looking forward. And we're looking, how can they have a new idea when they don't have any new ideas in Ottawa either? So, anyway, go catch that video. I have a lot of fun cutting these people up because when they take the time and I'm excluded and I'm being cheated, they're the ones cheated me. They benefited. And that's not sportsmanship, okay? If I was in your position, I wouldn't let anybody cheat my opponent. I want to beat them fair and square. Uh, something on the uh, I don't know who campaigns for these people, I campaign myself. <laughs> First of all, they don't open the door. They look at that people and say, no, no. <laughs> Those who open the door, the first thing they say, another crooked politician. <laughs> that is exactly what I hear over and over again. Exactly two hours before I arrived to this meeting, I was hearing that on Cosberg. So, I don't know where you get your... What about the role of the government? There are two main sources of the uh, wealth, human and natural, and one without another is useless. The role of the government is to keep both healthy. That I saw, I watched a movie when I was a young, a young man, about 30 years ago. It was Indian movie, they called Ruti Kapra or Mekan. The basic needs of the people, food, clothing, shelter, and health. You provide that, you have a healthy environment, and they don't have to cannibalize on the shoulder of the weak people. Thank you. Printing more money isn't going to solve anything. Yes, it will. <laughs> <laughs> Neither will bailing out big corporations that can't keep themselves going. The problems uh, with our economy is over-regulation. Uh, take immigration. Um, why, are, why, are we, why are there so many regulations on immigration? 
they're really good and, and hardworking, smart people in our community that 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 can't um, start businesses uh, because partly because they can't come to our country, and when they come here, often they can't find jobs uh, in the sectors they worked in in their own countries, and. The small business is really the engine of our economy. We really need to encourage small business owners in our community and uh, cut back on the regulations that uh, help them create small businesses. Thank you. Yes. The role of government is quite simple. It's to do what's the best interest for the citizens of Canada. That's why I'm political, because I no longer see our government working in our best interest. When Canada is leading bombing runs in Libya, I don't think that's in my best interest. When we're in so much debt that each riding is responsible for half a million dollars a day of interest, I don't believe that's in my best interest, and I don't believe it's in Canada's best interest. When we have sick, when we have hungry, when we have weak, and when we have a massive unemployment, I don't see that in the best interest. The role of government is simple is to be represented by yourselves. You need to understand that this is a job on interview. And you need to understand that you are the boss of the government. Until we change the system and allow us to have more say in Parliament, we will continue to have government not make the best decisions for the citizens of Canada. And that is wrong. As the progressive Canadian candidate for the Toronto Danforth riding, I want you to know that I really believe with all my heart that the role of government is to serve and to lead by example. And that's one of the reasons why I have clearly requested that you pay attention to the word Parliament. It comes from the French word parler, to talk or to speak. And I would like to challenge anybody in the parliament today to a debate that they could stand up to me with my voice for you here in Toronto Danforth. <laughs> I guarantee you, if you send me to Ottawa, Ottawa will be all shook up. <laughs> And I want, you, I want you to know that the... Thank you. Thank you very much. I want you to know it is an absolute abomination to the Canadian nation that in 1972 our parliamentarians were earning $24,000 a year. Today, if you add in their perks, it's half a million. For only six short years of service, they get a pension that would make the Queen of England jealous. So please, on March the 19th, forget about the Liberal NDP colours. Send me to Ottawa and I'll stand up for all of you, Liberals, NDP and the Green Party and the rest of you. And I'll say thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you pay a lot of money for a government, and you go through a lot of trouble to elect one. So you think that when you put these people in power, that they'd actually do something while they're there. It's very much their job to condition our economy, and the Maple Party intends to do so. We've been taken advantage of by bankers, and we shouldn't allow this to continue. Most people don't know that we owe our national debt to our, our domestic banks. All we have to do is stroke the pen, and we own these banks, and we own our own debt. We don't go bailing them out like we did in 2008, we did it two times. A real government will tell you what the situation really is. They won't lie to you and make you think that something's better than it is. It's not good to do that. A real government, after they nationalize the debts, or the national bank, what they can do is get rid of property tax, because you don't have to service that debt any longer. A real government, a strong government, would nationalize our national resources. That way you wouldn't have to pay world prices for gas. And then every long weekend, a Canadian price is higher than that one. A real strong government would look out for its people. A real strong government should feel like they are the people. 
It's important for us Canadians to choose different people these days. But not just for the sake of choosing something different. Choose something better. Stand up for yourselves. Get a little harder. We shouldn't be so soft and like the same people that lie to us all the time. It's not getting us anywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, once again, we have unanimity in answer. All of you believe that it is the job of government to provide for a fairly big way, at least, uh, its weakest citizens. And to some extent, that is a philosophical, social studies type of question. And we're now going to move to economics. All of you have pointed out at various times, first of all, in relation to younger people, the problem of jobs, low income, in relation to older people, the problem of uh, old age pensions, and you know, generally uh, a lack of resources, and people are strained everywhere. And of course, uh, the people in the middle uh, are too busy uh, trying to pay taxes, paying taxes, wondering whether they're able to manage anything or not. So, the economic question of the evening is, on a going forward basis, what do you believe the government in general should do to increase the size of the economic pie to be able to make all of things happen at once? <laughs> Very tough question. Um, Bob, sorry, but I'm gonna let you leave. <laughs> it's like home economics, very simple. I used to study medicine when I again one of my past lives. A patient comes to the emergency room, has a couple of the bullet bone wound and bleeding. The first thing we do, we stop the bleeding. With the government and economic policy, we have to stop bleeding. We cannot afford to spend $25 billion, go to Afghanistan for 10 years, and nothing to show for it. We cannot go to Libya for $2 billion or so, and nothing to show for it. We cannot go and put $4.7 billion budget for building a prison and then go after our youth, that is future of our country, and then they say, okay, your room is ready, you don't need to spend that. Yeah. Above immediate, immediate solution, as uh, uh, Leslie mentioned that, we pay, federal government pays about $31 billion interest alone over the $600 billion debt that we have to private banks. By utilizing Bank of Canada, that $30 billion can offset our deficit. And on 29th of the March, they will introduce a new budget for this year. And I bet you they have at least $40, $45 billion of the deficit to, share, to provide our citizens with. So yes, we can start with the transferring the interest rate from the uh, private bank to the uh, Bank of Canada gradually, I am not saying all of a sudden, and stop the bleeding. Thank you. I've been talking about increasing the size of the pie all night. You increase the size of the pie by ending up with more stuff. And you end up with more stuff when you end up with more jobs. And you end up with more jobs when you start off with more money, and you gotta go find yourself some money first. Well, they haven't got any. They've run out. They've admitted it. Bank of Canada's a good idea. Provincial bonds are just as good too. Actually, they're better because they've been proven. Now, yes, with an interest-free source of money, you can do what's called back tax. Right now, they front tax. They front tax you up front, and you gotta hope they don't waste it. And most of the time, they do. But a back tax is different. They borrow from the Bank of Canada interest-free. They finance all their stuff and then they present you the bill for what they spent it on and you get to see at the end of it what they spent it on and then you pay your back tax. Well, it's a lot smarter paying your back tax when you see what you're getting than paying a front tax and hoping they don't rip you off, especially when you keep getting ripped off. So, back to the Argentine solution. 
The Bank of Canada could too. It's like a Bank of Canada PayPal. Who knows PayPal? Log on to the Bank of Canada, open an account, cut checks to settle all your interest-bearing mortgages and debts, and then after that, all your payments go against the principal to the Bank of Canada, interest-free, sugar daddy bank in the sky. So it's just like PayPal, but with no interest. And then you can settle all your debts, convert to stable, and then finally get out of debt someday. I think two things we could do to immediately increase the size of the pie for everybody is uh, one, to end the war on terror that uh, we've been waging for over 10 years now. It's wasteful and ineffective. We're really creating more enemies than we're, we'll ever be able to get rid of. Um, another is ending the war on drugs, which is also very ineffective and also harms more people than it, it serves. Thank you. The whole question of increasing the size of the pie um, and uh, achieving economic prosperity doesn't actually also jive entirely with making all things happen at once. Uh, the first point I would want to say is that any government has to engage in knowing and setting priorities and making hard choices. And so one of the biggest things that distinguishes political parties and individuals is what is prioritized. F-35s, prisons that aren't needed versus OAS and increase GIS for the 5% of seniors or more who still live in poverty. Just a very rough and ready example. So prioritizing is absolutely key, even as you're growing the economy. You can never attend to everything that everybody wants. You have to have a philosophy about that. The second thing is, you need to make sure that you are acting in a rational way with respect to revenues. Uh, this government has been slashing corporate income tax, uh, corporate taxes to such an extent that we've been deprived as a country of billions and billions of dollars. Uh, it's amounting to at least $5 billion a year. That needs to be restored to at least 2008 levels so that we have something resembling some wiggle room on uh, the key priorities that all of us are concerned about. And finally, innovation and jobs come with a targeted approach to supporting the industries and the companies that actually create jobs and foster innovation. And in a green economy, where, which is what we all need to be heading towards, that philosophy has to take root. Thank you. Continuing on the analogy of the pie, I don't think there's anything wrong with the size of the pie. It's what's inside the pie is what's wrong. It's rotten. That pie of our money supply is full of debt. And how many of you understand how money is created? I'd like a show of hands on this, and please... Yeah, well, I'm bored, but that's what I would expect. Money into our system is created by you agreeing to the banks that you're going to put up your collateral in order to get that debt money put into your accounts. And a lot of people say this is too complicated. And a lot of people say it's too difficult to explain during elections. The Canadian Action Party has a comic at the back for you. Please feel free to take it at free of charge. It explains that you all own a bank. I would like a show of hands how many here understand that you as Canadian citizens own the Bank of Canada. Again, a quarter. This is the problem of our system. It's what's wrong in the pie. Don't keep looking for pie in the sky ideas here, folks. Our governments measure progress by GDP, which is basically growth. When we have a high divorce rate, our GDP goes up. When we have natural disasters, our GDP goes up. We should have a better way of measuring progress than GDP. Tim Jackson, uh, an economist in Australia, points out that we have a system that encourages us to buy things we don't need with money we don't have to make impressions that don't last on people we don't care about. <laughs> and every economist I've spoken to, and I speak to economists all the time, and I ask them, is it possible, in your opinion, to have continuous growth? And the answer is always no. No economist thinks that it's possible to continue forever in a finite world. So we have to stop thinking about growth. What we need to start thinking about is smart. We want to have 
good health care. We want to reduce the infant mortality rate. We want to increase life expectancy. We want to all have more time to spend with our families. These are the good things. We want to have a better way of measuring progress. And that's one of the things our party stands for. Thank you. As the uh, party of Sir John A. Macdonald, I want you to know that we actually have had a plan in place for over 10 years to pay down the national debt within a 25-year period. And we will make that available to any of the other parties if they would like to uh, take a look at that, because it could help quite a bit. But you know, we do have a very exciting plan. We, thanks to the Honourable Sinclair Stevens, we successfully sued the Harper regime and seized back the PC party logo. We are the Progressive Canadian Party. But that PC also, not just standing for your personal computer, but for Prosperity Canada. We have a platform that says we want to see an equitable grouping of our trading partners. Right now, all our eggs are in one basket. If Obama says jump, our friend Stevie Wonder says how high. And that's not the way it should be. So we need to remember this. We have 57 countries in the old British Commonwealth that look to us for leadership, including India and Pakistan. We're the only country in the world that has access to the 17 great nations of the Francophone Commonwealth. So I'm saying to you on March the 19th, abandon the Liberal, NDP, and the old neocons, send me to Ottawa, and I will bring Prosperity Canada to Toronto down forth. Thank you very much. So, uh, one of my favorite books is The Corporation, and, and that's because it uh, takes a really close look at how corporations operate, which is usually in a 30-day time frame or a quarter time frame. It's all about P&L sheets. It's not about the future. A government has the opportunity to look down the road. I strongly believe in sustainability. The three pillars of sustainability, I've said it over and over again, are people, planet, and profits. We need to take care of people in everything we do. We need to take care of the planet in everything we do. And to sustain those two things, we have to take care of profits. Now the NDP and the Conservatives, it's safe to say they look at the pie and they argue about who gets how big a piece and who gets how small a piece. I think we should, instead of worrying about who gets which piece, we should bake more pies. And the biggest pie we can bake is the green economy. It will save us heaps of money down the road, and we can pour that money back into people. Let's cut our carbon, carbon output, let's create a cap and trade system, and let's stop polluting our rivers and lakes and air. The money will come back to us, it will help us grow our economy. Thank you. There's been a lot of damage done to our economy over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, free trade pretty much kicked that off. Uh, if you want to get out of a mess, the best way to do it is throw your car in reverse and go the other way. Instead of continuing on with the way that we've been going. This is what got us into this mess. Globalization. Stop that first. Quit importing cheap goods to Canada. Puts our manufacturers out of work. And then quit relying on other countries to buy our goods. That's a pretty flimsy base for an economy. Hoping someone's going to buy your things, buy their cheap goods, putting our guys out of work. And then we have auctions and they come over here and they buy our equipment. And then they use this equipment to make this cheap goods that put us out of work again. Uh, the easiest thing to do is to do the opposite that got us into this. Banking. We allow private banks to charge interest on money that they created out of nothing. That means that every dollar that you get 
in the form of a loan, you have to pay back interest on it. Well, the interest has never, ever been created. There's always more debt than money. And that's what's going on in Greece right now. That's how the banking system works. You have to create debt-free dollars with no interest on them. And the Bank of Canada, to help people immediately, they'll take over their mortgages. And if they lose their job, they won't have to go on the street. We'll modify their payments. We'll hold their payments back. We won't ask them for money if they don't have money. We'll know that if they've been working or not. We'll know if they're trying. Give your own people the benefit of the doubt. Thank you. Thank you very much. As I listen to this, I realize this is, I think, the fifth time that I've heard groups or subparts of this group in discussion. And I never, and I don't recall waiting so long for the word green economy. Never. Uh, I was wondering if, if I was going to have to bring it up. But, uh, thank you, Grant. You know, I came here early this evening. I, uh, I made a really, really bad mistake. I'm almost a shame to admit. But I, did, I just didn't know. If I walked in with um, a bunch of bottles of water, plastic bottles of water for cannabis, to learn that apparently um, today is the national day against plastic bottled water or something. <laughs> Um, so, okay, uh, that's why they don't have a lot of water, by the way. Um, I think everybody agrees uh, that the environment is a gigantic issue. Okay, the only issue is whether it's number one, number two, number three, everybody agrees it. A year ago, something monumental happened, almost a year ago today, in fact. And that was the earthquake in Japan that um, caused severe damage to a large number of nuclear reactors. Um, I don't know what to believe in relation to this, but I mean, I have read things uh, suggesting that the damage was worse, or long run at least, than the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. I don't know anything about that, because I'm not a scientist, but I do recognize that it is an issue and no discussion of a candidate the, to go to Ottawa would be complete without some questions in relationship to it. So, we know, recognizing that the demand for energy is insatiable, it's getting greater and greater. What about the question of nuclear energy? I'd like to start with Craig, and I'd like to go sort of two down this way, and then we'll send back the other way. Well, I think it's important you set up the, you framed it right, John, that uh, there, there's two things about uh, nuclear energy. One is in a limited frame, it's clean energy in the sense that uh, we're not talking about carbon emissions. But in a fuller frame, it could produce catastrophic results for humankind and for the environment. Um, there are environmentalists who are on both sides of this, partly for that reason. Um, my own view is, uh, personally, I would love to see nuclear reactors uh, phased out and replaced by all, uh, all kinds of other forms of alternative energy. The phasing out, the transition, is obviously key. And the, the extent to which we can diminish uh, carbon emitting sources of uh, energy production and lower our, our energy use is going to determine whether or not we can do that. Um, in terms of the party, the Ontario NDP is extremely um, strong on, on, on this kind of transitional issue. Uh, the federal NDP, I think, is still grappling with it. And I guess I'm going to have to be part of that conversation. I can't give a more satisfactory answer than that. Thank you. Um, there's obviously things we all don't like about nuclear power. It is inherently dangerous. It is, uh, it, it leaves a waste legacy that we haven't figured out what to do with. And it has uh, proliferation issues. When I became interested in, in climate change, there are a lot of reputable scientists who say that it's necessary, so I felt I had to give it a second look. It's pretty clear that the scientists are coming around to realize that it's not the, the, the panacea they thought it would be. And there's a reason for that. A lot of scientists are saying that we need to, particularly in developed countries, we need to get rid of our coal in about a decade. 
Uh, we can't build a single nuclear plant in a decade. So it's not going to help us. From a climate change perspective, it's not going to help us. We need to get into the more nimble forms of, of addressing our energy issues, foremost of which is conservation. Secondly, it's going to be renewables, backed up by uh, energy storage. And we've got to get into that fast. Uh, we've got to transform our, electric, our, our entire vehicle fleet into electricity. Um, there are some very good studies done by Mark Jacobson in California which show how much faster that is and how much more emissions that eliminates if you plan that out. There's also uh, a, a study done by Joshua Pierce, my colleague in Kingston, um, who pointed out that if we were to replace our energy with nuclear sources, we would be getting into lower and lower grades of uranium to the point that we would be spending more energy building the nuclear plants than we would get out of them. It, it's an insane thing, and, and I'm satisfied that we don't need it. Yes, nuclear energy, it's not zero emissions, and uranium mining is one of the most egregious mining practices we know. I think it's important that we phase out nuclear power as fast as we can. The alternatives are not just solar and not just wind. That will take an enormous amount of capital to have that replace nuclear. And we're sitting on top of the greatest source of energy, I believe, and it's called geoexchange or geothermal energy. And that, instead of building massive power plants, and then having this electricity go, go out across wide tracks and lose at least 10%, 15%, 20% during the transmission, we need to have small power plants all over the place. This grid, this huge grid is archaic. We need to replace it. Biomass combined with geothermal, wind, and solar, I think that's the future. Thank you. We think that nuclear power is much too risky. Our nuclear power plants sit on the Great Lakes. And there's a high percentage of the world's water in the Great Lakes. A few little accidents and we won't have that water anymore. You have to stand up to the environmental groups and not pay so much attention to carbon. Pay more attention to groundwater. Thank you. We're going to ban fracking as well. We don't want to keep using these harmful petroleum recovery practices just to get the last little bit of oil out of our ground. We're going to have to eat the food soon that we grow on our own soil. We can't water with this water. We also need to ban genetically modified products and seeds. That's what the Naval Party is going to do. We're going to go in hard and we're going to ban these companies. Some of the most richest companies in the world. The wealthiest ones. With the most political power. They don't have power with the Naval Party. The people can and will if they choose us. If not, they get the same that they always got. All we can do is offer people a choice. And we hope it's a good choice for people. And in time, we hope to unite this nation. A strong nation can achieve a lot. No empire in the history of the world has achieved anything while they're divided. For good or bad purposes. They achieved when they were united. And our nation's not united. We're united right now. But in three years, we hope to unite this nation. Thank you very much. I have to say that each and every one of you presents this evening as a very proud Canadian. And we're proud as candidates to see you have filled this church. We, honestly, you would not be here if you didn't care about this great nation. I believe we are the greatest nation on the face of this earth. And I believe the world is looking to us for leadership. I was appalled when Stephen Harper lost his opportunity in South Africa. Instead, he let the whole world down and lined up with the, our neighbors to the south. I will tell you this, the Progressive Canadian Party is dedicated to the elimination of nuclear energy, but we, in that regard, want you to know that our PC stands for Progress with Care. 
We want to wean this off properly. One death, one death because of the nuclear fallout is one death too many. We cannot allow even the remote possibilities that exist in Pickering and other places to continue to exist. But I will say this, if we really are interested in doing something about it, then please become a progressive Canadian on March the 19th, and I'll tell you why. The federal government needs to stop crippling our students with unbelievable, nearly $20 billion of student debt. We need to fund our undergraduate, university and college students. They will then be equipped to help us with this problem. Thank you very much. Questions like this often remind me of a wise man told me, one of my mentors, he said they always amplify everything. And with these type of questions, I'd like to amplify it. Let's put it, push it forward to 200 years. What will our future generations say when they look back at it? I believe with nuclear energy, they'll look at it like we used to put our sewage in our streets. You know, we used to put sewage in our streets to the point that we got the bubonic plague. Japan has shown us what dependence on nuclear power has done to this world. I live in British Columbia. We are worried about it. So of course, we need to advance technology and we need to be innovative so that when we have a chance to look ahead in the future, that we can actually see that this generation was smart enough and got away from dirty fuels like oil and nuclear power. I have to, I have to admit I don't know a lot about nuclear energy. I'm not a uh, nuclear physicist or deal in uh, the economics of energy, but uh, I am encouraged by, encouraged by um, uh, the future and advancements being made and how to create uh, different forms of energy. And uh, I mean, ultimately, I'd have to agree with Chris that, you know, ultimately facing out nuclear is a, is a good thing. Um, until that time comes, I mean, uh, we've certainly benefited from it. Um, and uh, there haven't been huge disasters uh, in our country. Um, but again, in the, in the long run, uh, phasing out nuclear power would be uh, a good thing. Well, to answer the question, the bombs in Japan had pounds of uranium, and the reactors, they have tons. And those tons of spent fuel, guess where they put them? They gotta put them in water. And where they put the water? At the bottom of the structure? No! On top! So if it cracks, it leaks. And just last week, a Japanese scientist said if it cracks again, it's the end. Hey, I watched that Japanese engineer crying on TV. He know what he did. So anyway, yeah, I studied some nuclear engineering. And there's nothing more stupid and dangerous than nuclear. And these plants are all over the place and they can happen anywhere, so we have to decommission. We all agree, but they got no money. And that's why nothing's happening. And I got a way of paying people to decommission and nuclear, okay? So, and my final point is, that's what's so dangerous about nuclear radiation, fallout in particular. It's not like background radiation, same thing they say. Hey, a piece of plutonium a meter away is going to do so much damage, but when it moves into a centimeter, a hundred times closer, it's a hundred squared more deadly. And when it moves inside you, a micron away from your bone, it's not a million times more dangerous, it's a million square. And if it gets inside you, it burns out the circuits in your cells, blow out a few stop switches, and you've got to sell it won't stop growing. That's cancer! Well, baking soda binds with uranium. So you've got to take baking soda first so it binds with uranium before the uranium binds with you. Baking soda candidate, that's me. I like to look at it from a different angle. Uh, I think we need a national energy policy, coast to coast. One of the reasons that we face in different provinces with a shortage of energy is because we have one nation with 10, 10 and 3, 3, 13 different governments trying to put their own personal policies in place. We were talking about the coast-to-coast -coast energy. I, was, I had discussion about a few nights ago with another gentleman, a friend of mine who is in engineering. He said, why not we change the AC to DC? 
Why not we run the copper from coast to coast? We have land. And we get, get rid of the grids as mentioned earlier, so we don't have uh, instances like 2003 blackouts. Lack of political will caused the shortage of the energy. Lack of political will caused the damage in nuclear power plant. Lack of political will caused people to go and run around and asking for more energy. If we have national energy policy, we won't have enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. What do you think? Great group of candidates this evening? Fortunately, we're more or less on schedule, which means that we're going to be able to do something a little bit different tonight, so I hope it works. Uh, but what we're going to do is basically uh, have something going on where the candidates are going to have a chance to ask each other candidate uh, questions with a bit, of, uh, a bit of response, a 60 second response. Now the way this is going to work is our enforcer here uh, is going to randomly, or for whatever way he wants, uh, choose one of these candidates to draw a name out, and that will be the person to whom he asks the question. And after that person will have 60 seconds to answer, and that person will choose the next person, etc., etc. So, Kyle? Craig Scott. Means, okay, so you're going to ask Craig Scott anything you want to ask him, and Craig has 60 seconds to answer. Yes? Are we allowed to trade? No. <laughs> John, is this our last interaction? Is this our last interaction tonight? Like this is the last thing we're going to say? No, you're going to get to say good night. <laughs> That's it. There's no, no well, chance. Well, how about saying O Canada? Yeah, we could do that. Our we'll closing statement he wants right. to know. But will, will, we, will we have a closing statement? Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. How long? All right, Mr. Scott, my question to you is, um, our Prime Minister has left a lot of our fellow citizens hanging. Uh, our senior citizens will probably lose some of their benefits. Our soldiers have been on the streets for years now after they've come home. One of our citizens, Mr. Mark Emery, is doing five years in American prison for selling some marijuana seeds. Mr. Harper thought it would be a good idea to let him be extradited to America to go sit in a prison cell where every time he broadcasts a report through his magazine articles, he's mistreated. Now, a guy like this, who got us into a few wars or perpetrated you know, our involvement, and he's a suspected war criminal because of the uh, Taliban intern or intern refugees being uh, handed over to their government, being tortured or murdered. I'd like to know that if the Taliban gained power in Afghanistan and you're in the government, would you allow Mr. Harper to be extradited to Afghanistan to stand trial for war crimes? <laughs> Christopher, Chris, 
And uh, I'd simply like Chris to, to give you the opportunity to tell us what you think the single most important idea or position of your party is that you'd like people to go away with. Thank you very much. The single idea that's most important to the Canadian Action Party is to retain our sovereignty. We're losing it. This party was started by an ex-liberal that believed that we were losing Canada. I unfortunately think that we've almost lost it. This is serious issues to all of us. Our sovereignty is at stake here. We're heading towards a global economy. We're losing jobs. We're losing our resources. That is what Canadian Action Party stands for. That's why we talk about the Bank of Canada. That's why we talk about citizens getting more involved in their politics. And that's what's most important for me in the Canadian Action Party. Thank you, Greg. He's not here. Are you here? Ask him anyway. Paul? You mentioned that uh, you won't be elected. Yes. But if Prime Minister, what would you be your first task at hand? The first task is to get rid of the party politics. Very simple. Pass the legislation to get the name of the party and partisanship out of the House of Commons. Every riding has to send their own representative. Abolition of the, the or removing of the name of the parties from the uh, electoral, uh, electoral uh, ballots. And uh, it, we stop the party advertising at the time of the election for the candidates. Turma. John. Let me ask you I want to ask you uh, one question. You are at the same boat as I am. You, I know that none of us get elected. What is your real motive? <laughs> when I see Argentina get saved in their depression, when I see Russia get saved in their depression by using bond currencies, and I see you guys suffering and complaining full time about not enough money, not enough jobs. I come here with an alternative you can use. I'm an engineer. If I tell you do this for it to work, it's not like them saying, we want something, you need this, we want you to have that. There's a difference between we want you to have something and here's how you can have it. So, I've run all these times over the years so that the guys who get elected go to Parliament. And then 30 years later I can point at them and say, Hey, Steve Pakin, you heard 30 years ago about the Argentine solution. How come you stayed stupid so long? <laughs> so, same thing with these winning candidates. They're going to have heard about how to fix the system when they get there. And who knows, they might remember something. But if Ellen Smith marks smoking marijuana, they probably haven't got enough brain cells. <laughs> My turn, I want. Oh, 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 oh. How's this work? Pull one, anyone? Who do I get now? The Green Party candidate. Oh. <laughs> All right. The other day, I bet a hundred dollars. Climate Gate, two years ago, they discovered that the hockey stick crap was a fraud and massaged the data, and they even used a trick to hide the decline. Then they argued, oh, scientists use tricks all the time. I said, it ain't the trick I'm mad about, it's the word hide. Well, guess what? Temperature's been going down, and I think these people should be charged for murder for every person found frozen to death in Bermuda shorts, expecting global warming. So, I got a hundred dollars, the temperature's been going down at the last meeting, and I'm going to ask the lady and the NDP and the Liberal who all talked about man-made global warming, why won't you take my hundred dollar bet when I say it's been getting colder and they've been lying to us? Yeah! For the record, John, I took your bet. All right, let's have a debate after the election. Let's I go. also want to point out that John is deeply 
mistaken about what Life of the Decline meant. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's funny. It's people think that Life of the Decline means, means that there's a decline in temperature. That isn't actually what they were referring to. High decline in popularity? <laughs> they were actually talking about, and I know this because I am the climate change critic for the Green Party. I read it. So, what they were referring to was actually a decline in what should have been the temperatures based on the tree rate data when temperatures were actually going up. That's what they wanted to hide because they've been using tree ring data to recover. And, and I, I do think this is a problem. I do think that it, it sheds some kind of problem into the science and I am looking into it. But there's a lot of different strings that, that show that the climate science is right. I bet it going down. John, I can't answer if you're talking. <laughs> that what they were looking at was that the tree ring data had been matching, correlating with the temperature for many years, but it was going down in the last 20 years as temperatures were going up, and that's what they wanted to hide. They hid it by, at that point, saying, you know what, we're going to use the real temperatures from now on because we don't trust the tree ring data. That's what they referred to. Did you You're wrong. The Did you yeah, the and the temperatures are going up. Thank you. You know what I want you to do? I want you to sing.
My, uh, my work puts me in contact with uh, some of the most vulnerable people in our community. Uh, I can tell you that making more and stricter laws won't make our community safer. Uh, Canada is quickly becoming one of the most regressive Western democracies in terms of criminal justice. The recent focus on tough-on-crime legislation has been demonstrated to be expensive and ineffective. Resources that could be much more efficiently used for the uh, prevention of crime are being directly directed exponentially more expensive uh, band-aid solutions um, that uh, will only aggravate the, the situation. Um, so thank you again for your question, and uh, that's why I'm impressive. Oh, Andrew Keats. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Grant Gordon. Um, if, if you're elected uh, PM, or member of Rome, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, I'm not nervous at all, I swear. My friend said, yeah, I'm for the PM thing, I'll tell you that. And that um, wouldn't be progressive, believe me. <laughs> if there was a vote, on um, repealing laws that uh, uh, punish people for crimes that where there's no victim, victimless crimes like uh, sex work and uh, marijuana possession. How would you vote? Hmm. Hmm. That's a great question. <laughs> that that sounds like John Stuart Mill should come to the board. Here. Um. I think it has to be more specific than that. Would you like it to be about sex trade or about marijuana? Let's do marijuana. Sure. Can we do marijuana? Okay. <laughs> country is 
faltered forever. Yes, yes. Do you think this is curious? Do you think this is troubling? Thanks for your question. Regarding Quebec, you should just think of them as any other Canadian citizen. If uh, life was better for them, and they didn't think that their uh, pet turtle could do a better job around the country, they probably have fewer separatists. I don't think it's a lot to do with racism, I think it's got to do with economics and the way they want to live. Um, another thing is, the referendum issue. It's a Canadian issue. When someone wants to leave Canada, it's a national issue, not a provincial issue. If there's going to be a referendum, it'll be a Canadian referendum from coast to coast, and yeah, 50 plus 1, it'll do. Thank you. Well, that was, uh, that was fun. I mean, you enjoyed that. Dorian reminded me that uh, there should be closing statements, and it is that time. Um, what I had thought well, was this. Again, I want to go back to the beginning. We are electing an MP for Toronto Danforth. We are electing an MP for Toronto Danforth. We are electing an MP for Toronto Danforth. Awesome. So, 60 seconds each. We're a bit pressed for time. Question I would like you to answer, but you don't have to, would be to complete the following blank. What I would like on March 19th for people to remember about me when they are casting their ballot is. Uh, we started with Leslie originally. Did you get the first? Yes, we did. Fun on the way. What I'd like people to remember about me is as follows. A lone wolf, <laughs> his budget, if it if reaches $700, I have spent a lot <laughs> in the whole election, a stand up in front of three giants that you have seen their flyers and their advertisement all over Danford, Toronto Danford area. All three talks about environment, but they put their coral glass over there. Uh, I want to remember something about me. If that lone wolf, nobody, can stand up and put his life on hold and challenge these people, every one of you can do, and at least, at least, put your share of participation on election day. I am not asking to vote for me, because we don't. <laughs> but I ask you, when you put your eggs, do it with responsibility. You don't put it for a logo. I have a logo much be better than all of these three. You can go to my website at voterseco.com and see my logo. My logo is better than all of these. <laughs> However, don't vote for logo. That logo comes back and will bite you the place that you don't want to be beaten. <laughs> well, there's a really scary world out there and really bad times coming. You just got to look at the rest of the world and don't think you're going to escape it. Okay? And when Argentina went broke and the bank shut down, imagine the next day you can't get your money out of the bank. What are you going to do? Remember me then, okay? What did they do? They had no choice. They had to go back to barter systems. Same in Russia, same in Greece. So, yeah, you got a right to all the misery you deserve and all the misery you vote for. But you could have voted for the only guy up here with a high-tech engineering degree, sharper than all the others, with answers that made sense to you all night. Because when you walk out that door, I bet you you can't remember one thing these people said because they said not one thing concrete. It was nothing more than, you need this, you need that, and I wish it for you. A wish list, but never how to get it done. And me, always how to get it done. What I'd like uh, people to remember about me, um, other than my nervousness, is uh, 
But for every problem we face, uh, I want the first question to be, is it possible that we can solve that problem with more freedom instead of less? Just consider if it's possible. I mean, sometimes the answer is going to be no. Uh, if someone is hurting someone else and you have the ability to stop them, you might not be able to solve that problem by giving uh, the person doing the harm more freedom. Um, but laws about buying raw milk or growing specific plants in your garden, I mean, let's at least consider the possibility of going with more freedom in those cases, right? That being said, I'm not proposing immediately throwing uh, the baby out, uh, baby out with the bathwater. Um, but the residents of Toronto Danforth deserve better than uh, what we have now. I will represent the, our riding by supporting and protecting the values, choices, rights, and freedoms of our community, not just the big part, a big party, uh, and a of, in Ottawa with an agenda. Thank you. Well, in the spirit of the question, in, in one sentence, uh, I'll do my very best to represent the Toronto Danforth with integrity, uh, with energy, uh, with creativity, and uh, with a sense of uh, who I'm ultimately responsible to. And that was one of the themes tonight, which is the people of this riding. In order to stand up for the people of this riding and for all Canadians when I'm in Ottawa. Thank you so much. What I want you to remember is I'm just like you. I was one of those people that used to spectate politics. For 38 years of my life, I never took part in it. I never wanted to get involved in it. I didn't believe in it. I now lead a political party. I want you to know that you have that same power. At the beginning of the day, I asked you how many wanted a better government. You all put up your hands. That comes from you. I also want you to remember that I asked you if you know that you own a bank. You must research this. You must look into how money is created. We all are involved in it, and it's part of our process of our dilution of our country. We owe so much debt outside of this country, and we're paying so much interest that we're suffering. So remember that I'm just like you. I took some time to participate, and I thank you for participating this evening. Thank you. I am in this race for one reason only. I think we have a solemn duty to our children to ensure that they have the opportunities that we have, and those opportunities are seriously in threat because of the dialogue that's missing in Parliament, and I desperately want to bring that, that dialogue in. It is clear to me that there would be shock waves in the biggest shock waves in Parliament that would make the most tremendous and important changes for this planet, for our children, and for Canada if I were elected, or if there was a very strong Green vote. Please keep in mind that when Elizabeth May came second in uh, London North Centre, immediately before the Liberal Leadership Convention in 2006, as a result, the one who was elected came to the Liberal Leadership Convention and demanded that they elect somebody who was green-minded to lead the party. If you elect, or come close to electing, the climate change critic to join Elizabeth May in Parliament right before a leadership convention of the NDP or a leadership convention of the Liberals, you will see results. Thank you. Unlike my wonderful and modest colleague at the end, I want you to know unequivocally I am planning to win this election. I am running to win this election. I have been involved in politics as a social activist for over 25 years, and I have just recently celebrated my 40th anniversary as a proud Canadian citizen. And I want you to know this, it is my desire, with your help, to break with the vicious cycle. I want you to take the words of my dear colleague at the end there and apply them to me. I can do what an independent can do and more. We are a registered party. We are the oldest party in Canada, the party of Sir John A. Macdonald. And we really want you to know we are progressive Canadians. I want to ask you seriously to consider the ramifications. Imagine if you dare 
to shed your political colors, send Dorian Baxter to Ottawa, it will make headlines, and Stephen Harper will never be the same again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Don't start the clock. First of all, let's hear it for our fantastic moderator this evening. This was the best debate we had by far. Yes. So thank you. Yes. And the most fun. And the best singing as well. Start the clock. So, there are, hopefully there are some undecided people in this room. I encourage you to go to my website, grantgordon.ca. And I encourage you to go to Craig Scott's website, craigscott.ndp.ca. And I encourage you to climb all over both websites. Get to know us. Look for empathy. Look for passion. And look for ideas that will help people in our riding right here, right now. And I encourage you to go to the polls. And when you're casting your ballot, think back. Who had the ideas? Who had the passion and empathy? Who's going to help people in this riding who are suffering on March 20th? Thank you. Thank you. How I'd like to be remembered, it sounds almost like John wants me to give my own eulogy tonight. Uh, I'd like to remember me not just so much on this election, that I am trying to win this election, but in three years. Think of what I've told you, and see if these things make any more sense to you in three years. Just do a little bit of digging, learn a couple things, improve yourself a little bit. You'll know how your engine works. Now, the way our nation works isn't so straight up. And get in there, learn how these mechanisms of government work. We're pretty far from our own boss in Canada, but if you vote for the Maple Party, you'll be one step close to being your own boss in your own nation. Thank you very much. Well, oh, thank you very much. That was great. And I, you know, I have a sense that, you know, there, there, there's good news and there's bad news coming out of this evening. The good news is, I think it's awfully clear that whichever one of these people is elected, we're going to be well represented. And I think they deserve it. <laughs> bad news is, I don't know who to vote for. <laughs> but. You know, I feel there's a lot of patriotism. I think there's a lot of commitment, not only to the riding, to the country. And, you know, one of the, what they did really nicely at the end of the first debate, I was actually serious, was uh, they ended by singing about Canada, and I'd like to invite the candidates to lead us to that in the evening. Would you stand together, please? <laughs> oh, God.